Oh, and I didn't. <laughs> well, I want to welcome all of you here. Uh, there's some new people I've never met before, and I'd like to introduce myself to you. My name's Roy Blizzard. Um, I think it was uh, Carol told me that y'all have some property <coughs> pretty close around here. Yeah, right there, Gotham Brick there. Oh, uh, right by the second right. one? Right, right. Okay. Uh, well, I was passing out flyers this week. I don't know if y'all had a mailbox up there and one of them got stuffed in there or not, but I passed out about 200 flyers and cards to let people know that Joppa Church is here. And uh, I stopped and met Jamie the, uh, yesterday, I think it was. And uh, he lives just a couple of blocks up past this little bridge and uh, had a nice conversation with him. I'm glad to see him here today. And uh, we need to keep him in prayer because he's been fighting some medical conditions that uh, a lot of people seem to be having now because of various uh, things that our government is allowing in our food and this sort of thing. But, uh, you know, any time that... Uh, I meet someone like this, I'd like you to get to know him because we need to keep him in special prayer for his needs as well. Now then, uh, I want to talk to you guys today specifically about what is this term forgiveness. The reason I wanted to start with it is because forgiveness is the foundational stone of our faith. If it wasn't for forgiveness, uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we'd probably be fighting some internal war all over the place. But we can have a peaceful life right here and be in a state of forgiveness. And I want you to take a minute to look at Psalms 51.10. In Psalms 51.10, is a really important passage for us to understand. David had a true conception of forgiveness when he prayed this prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then he goes on and says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. This is a really important passage because it has to do with the um, way that we view forgiveness. Now, we banter this term about incessantly in the churches, just constantly. And we claim that it's important, but how is it important? Sure, we, we want to know how forgiveness works for us and how it works in the church. But we just can't say, oh, we need to forgive without really understanding some very important aspects of this. But put simply, forgiveness for us is the ability to access and then to pass on to others those aspects of God that were granted to us as free gifts so that we may remain in a state of fellowship with God and man. That's Try to get this in your, your, your soul, down in your spirit. This is a free gift, and it is the ability to access and pass on to others those aspects of God that were granted to us for free so that we can remain in a state of fellowship in this intimate relationship with one another and with God. Okay? But we have to think about who it is that forgives who 
and why this is important to our spiritual growth. Do we just have to forgive the person sitting next to us? Do we have to forgive some murderer sitting on death row? Who is it that we have to forgive? And why is it important for us as Christians? And it's something we really don't often think about. The other aspect that we have to look at is can we be saved, whatever this word saved means, without forgiveness? And what is that relationship of forgiveness to what we call the kingdom? Okay. Now, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the word forgive can mean any of the following. First, it can mean to stop feeling anger towards or about someone who's done something wrong or to stop blaming someone. Now, we often blame somebody for something and we get hung up on it. Oh, he did this to me and I, you, know, you might not speak to somebody for 50 years because he did something wrong to me. <clears throat> whose, whose problem is this? This is our problem. Okay? Secondly, to forgive someone for something wrong, or in other words, to stop requiring payment of a debt. This is a concept of pardon. This is kind of what Jesus did on the cross. He paid our price to redeem us back to Him. Now, in English, we have a little bit of uh, overlap here, but the word forgive or forgiveness in the Bible is the translation of three basic Hebrew words, namely kafar, nage, and salah. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details in the Hebrew because I'm going to be the only one understanding this right now. But these three words encompass at least eight different English words and the concepts around them have even more uh, implications in this word forgiveness. So that they all have some kind of like a different flavor that they bring into looking at this word forgiveness. But basically these three words have the concepts of covering over or pardoning or the carrying away of some transgression. Now, over a period of time, you're going to learn that in Hebrew, there, when you say one word, you've got about 20 other words that all relate to that word. Just like repentance... And you have forgiveness, salvation, atonement. All of these words all shift the, the flavor of what you're looking at with this word and the, how you look at it. But what it is important for us is to look at this because it can help us to get a, a better and deeper, richer meaning of what these words mean when we look at it. Now, God pardons us as sinners. We're all sinners. But although His pardon is often thought to be different than human forgiveness by a lot of people, if we're buried with Him in His baptism and we arise with Him in His life, we become directly tied to His existence so that His being becomes our being. So we have to think about extending the same pardon and the same forgiveness to others as Jesus himself did and God did. Because if he is truly in us, when we speak forgiveness to someone, it should be with the same power and the same authority and the same feeling that Jesus had. What did Jesus say to the man that uh, was sitting there in pain and suffering? 
your sins be forgiven you. He just forgave the man. And it, in that act of forgiving, a transformation occurred. Now, some of these Hebrew words dealing with forgiveness are used to describe what I call the atoning nature of the concept of forgiveness. Certain other of these words that I set back up here, the kafar, nagay, and salah, another one of these words dealing with forgiveness are used to describe the unburdening nature of the concept of forgiveness. It takes away our burdens that we have. But however, there is a third component that most people overlook. And I mentioned this verse a couple of weeks ago. But I call this the exchanging nature of the concept of forgiveness. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 and 30, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He takes our burden. He exchanges that with us. These passages in Matthew, they relate to Isaiah 40, 31. This is the passage I told you a few weeks ago. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they will run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, as I explained to you before, these words in Hebrew literally mean you will exchange your measly earthly power and existence for Christ's. It literally says that in the Hebrew. If you have a problem, give it to God. Exchange it. Don't worry about it. Give it to Him and let Him carry it. It's His burden once you are dead and buried and resurrect in His existence, in a newness of life. Amen. That's what it's talking about. <clears throat> Why is this exchanging nature important? I want you to really think about this. Because every one of us will have this transforming event in our life. Sin takes away innocence. And we can't ever recover this on our own. Never. But Jesus' nature allows us to unburden ourselves of the guilt and the shame and the blame that we feel when our innocence is lost by exchanging His nature for our own. I'm telling you, it is important to think about this because every one of us has had an event that has transformed our life and we go, oh my God, my innocence is lost. I can never think about something in terms again and you want to blame and you want to heap burdens and coals of fire on ourselves pull out the flagellum and just be sitting there you know whipping ourselves but we don't have to do that Jesus came that we may live These three concepts of atoning, unburdening, and exchanging, when you apply these together, that's what allows us to exist within God's existence. And it's right here that many of us fail miserably because the church has for too long failed to inform us of this third aspect, this exchanging nature. 
we don't just allow God to cover our sin and carry them away. We are allowed. Now listen to me carefully. We are allowed to exchange our measly abilities with Christ and then allow His fullness, the entire fullness of Christ, to flow through us to others. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Hallelujah. We can allow that to flow through us because He is in us. We exist within Him. We are to be the forgivers and allow Christ to forgive us. We have to allow Christ to forgive us in order to forgive others. Did you hear what I just said? Okay. We have to forgive ourselves. Why is it that we can forgive someone and everyone else, from murderers to rapists to whatever, but we refuse to forgive ourselves? If Christ comes to me, by golly, I should be the first person I forgive. But sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case for people anymore. They want to hold on to whatever it is that they're burdened with. God gives these gifts for free. We don't have to do anything except accept them. Do you understand that when we purposefully hold on to unforgiveness, whether it's to someone else or to ourselves, then we are rejecting not only God, but we're rejecting all of the gifts that He has for us. Because if we can't accept the forgiveness in our own life, how can we accept anything? This is the most important concept that we can possibly get in our mind. We have to start forgiving ourselves and move on to forgiving others. But not only this, this forgiving of ourselves, when we refuse to forgive our, ourselves and others, what does that do? It allows bitterness, rage, and provoking to anger to set in within our hearts, and that can lead to our destruction. Do you remember who Simon the sorcerer was? Look at what Peter said of Simon the sorcerer in Acts 28-23. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. When we don't learn to forgive ourselves, sin takes us captive. can you do to get yourself out of the snare, that trap? We have to back up and take ourselves out of the snare. That's how Timothy describes it. Peter strongly re reprimands Simon for wanting to buy the Holy Spirit and its power. And he states that he needs to repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Okay, when we have unforgiveness in our heart, we need to get down on our knees and pray for forgiveness. Amen. Because we have to ask God to forgive us. 
for it's a sin. We have rejected what God has for us. Simon, he pleads with Peter to pray to the Lord on his behalf that he may be a part of their ministry and that his heart be right with God and that he, he may not be captive to sin. He recognized the importance that he did not any longer want to be captive to sin. Now, Jeremiah the prophet, he literally speaks against those people who had unforgiveness. Literally, he says to God, Thou shalt not cover their iniquity. And this indicates that Jeremiah has in mind God's atoning cover of sin. These people understood that if you had unforgiveness, you were captive to sin. And that you had things brewing in you that were not good. But God can hold back from man the covering over of sin and the forgiving him. So we can allow ourselves to go through our entire life suffering because God is not allowing that forgiveness to flow through us. And we will keep ourselves out of the blessings of God by doing it. This should scare us. I don't want to go through life not enjoying the blessings of God. And that's what unforgiveness will do. It will keep us bound in bitterness and in sin. Because one thing bitterness tends to do is grow. Bitterness can kill not only you, but it can kill your relationships to your family and your friends. We can kill this church in a heartbeat with bitterness. And this is the fruit of the plant of the seed of unforgiveness. We need to not only ask God to forgive us of our sins, but we must as go as our friends and neighbors as well and ask forgiveness. And in fact, in Judaism, it was taught that one must go to their neighbor and ask forgiveness before they could sacrifice and ask forgiveness from God for their own sin. And that's important. Before God could forgive them, they had to ask forgiveness from their brothers and sisters. Not just for the big stuff, but if you hadn't spoken to your neighbor or your family member or whatever for three days due to some whatever, the pie didn't come out right and you let it sit in the oven for 15 minutes longer than it should and the crust was black. Whatever. Some silly thing. You couldn't even testify in a court for or against them if their lives depended upon it. That's how critical it was to ask forgiveness and be in a state of right relationship with your brother or sister. We need to practice restoring our brothers into favor through their repentance and Christ's atonement and allowing them to exchange their burdens with Jesus by forgiving ourselves. You hear that? By forgiving ourselves we help the others to get their repentance and atonement. How can, you, how can I go to you and say, we need to just pray and ask God for repentance because you hurt your wife? How can we do that if I've got unrepentance in my own life? I'm not being sincere when I come to you. It affects us. It keeps us from dwelling with God.
the covering of our sin and the forgiveness of us as a sinner can only be understood as two aspects of the one truth. And both are displayed in God's provision of mercy through Christ. It was God's mercy through Christ that allows the repentance and atonement to come to us. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can we make us meet to appear in God's presence. We can't stand before God except that we are covered with his atonement Amen. and his blood. It's that important. This robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put on every repenting, believing soul if we ask. When a person's sins are forgiven, are forgiven, then it implies that he stands covered by the righteousness of Christ and is in the eyes of God justified which in its deepest meaning, justification, its content is the same as forgiveness of sins. We stand before God justified and forgiven of our sins. So even that one Hebrew word I said before, kafar, it points to a synonymous conception of forgiveness and justification. So there's a very close connection between the concept of forgiveness and atonement and justification. Now this other word, the Hebrew word nagah, it suggests a broad conception of the doctrine of forgiveness as well, and namely the actual reclaiming from sin. So... God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act which he sets us free from the condemnation or the burdens of our sin that we would have to carry. It's not only forgiveness for sin, but it's a reclaiming. Just like Jesus goes after the lost sheep, God literally comes and reclaims us as his own. He comes after us, seeking us. We have to say, yes, God, yes, Jesus, I accept what you have, that free gift. I'm tired of carrying around my burden. This is the outflowing of redeeming love that transforms our hearts. It transforms that seed of bitterness into a tree of life that can sprout fruit. Beautiful fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. In the Psalms, David says, Forgive all my sins. David's repentance was sincere and it was deep. There was no effort on his part in diminishing his crimes. He took responsibility for them. And he showed no desire to escape the threatened judgments when he prayed. Did the people on the cross, what, what happened to them? One asked for forgiveness. Jesus said, I forgive you. He still was, had to go through the punishment that was meted out. It doesn't mean that we don't have to suffer sometimes because of the choices we've made. But we don't have to carry it anymore. We have someone who is our advocate and our creator who can carry those for us. Amen. David saw the enormity of his transgression against God the defilement of his soul, and he loathed his sin. Do we loathe our sin? We should. Sometimes we don't understand how we do this. We just 
hate the sin. We decide, you know, I'm tired of living this existence. I want something better. And I, I want to exist with God. He didn't pray for a pardon, but he prayed for purity of his heart. Lord, create in me a clean heart. How many times have we wished to have a clean heart, not to remember all the bad things that have happened to us, that we've had to go through, to live through? I know I've prayed that. Many a time. He not only asked for release from the guilt or the punishment of sin, but from the sin itself. He asked to be released, to be reclaimed by God, to take him out of prison. He was tired of being locked up in chains for that sin and wanted to be free. Atonement, an unburdening, and an exchanging. David was a man after God's own heart. Shouldn't we accept that forgiveness from God right now? I mean, that's what it's all about. It's free. All we have to do is ask. Amen. And is there anybody here today that would just like to pray and say, you know, I, I'm tired of carrying this burden. I'm tired of it. If you've never asked Jesus into your life on a very personable, personal level, we can do that right now. It doesn't matter if you've been to church all your life. Have you allowed God to forgive you? If you haven't allowed God to forgive you of whatever it is you're carrying, now's the time. Just come on up here and we'll pray. Because it's that important. It's that critical for the rest of your life. Amen. And if you want to pray right now, just come on up here. I'm ready to pray. And we've got other people here that can pray with you. And it doesn't matter for what it is. It can be the smallest thing, but if it's pestered you for longer than 10 seconds, it's too long. And you need to ask God to forgive you and release you from having to carry that burden around because it's not yours. If there's anybody here that needs to pray, come on down. Let's pray right now. Does anybody here have any needs at all that you want to pray with and pray about? Come on down here.